Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Show to View with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Kansas City, St. Louis, Tiki, Four Square Rum, Tequila Ocho, and The Urge. That's right, everybody. Your favorite late 90s, early aughts, ska slash punk rock fusion band, The Urge. Today's guest is the senior brand development manager at Altamar Brands, Mr. Brandon Cummins. It is Kansas week at show to v first we had justin cardwell of bc's kitchen soon to make an announcement about a massive career change something very very exciting that will lead him in a whole new direction but today talking to brandon we get into it he's a guitar player you can tell he's not a drummer he likes film he likes making films he likes editing he likes technology he has constantly evolved with the career paths he's taken starting in wine moving to cocktails and now working with some fine brands like Foursquare Rum, Tequila Ocho, and Right Gin. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this chat with Brandon Cummins. Kansas, it is the mixture of both okay. agriculture and urban influence. Because, you know, in a place like Topeka, mm-hmm. especially being the capital, you know, you have the senators, the legislature coming, comes in once a year. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and so there is definitely some urban influence there. Um, and my dad was a restaurateur and had multiple places. His longest standing was open for 47 no years. No kidding. What kind of what kind um, of restaurants? All kind of American influenced. Okay. You know, so kind of the drive-ins. Yeah. I mean, you got to think, like, he was opening bars and restaurants in the 50s and 60s. Wow. Um and so it was all that kind of vibe, and you know he had a he had a tiki bar, he had a like really he was, yeah he was collecting menus from all these tiki places around the U.S. too. So it's just there was a lot of like it was an interesting kind of melting pot of culture in Topeka in yeah. particular. Uh, I think specifically in the seventies and eighties, which is you know it's funny because it's there are no spontaneous careers. No, <laughs> you know what I mean. Not at like, all. It's ingrained it in always something. Feels or seems like oh sure. man, there was that one moment that changed my whole life, and it's like no, no, like, it was my whole life. Really that look changed back, my whole it's life. Like, that was literally building up the entire time. <laughs> um, one of my best friends growing up as a total side story. Um, you know, he was super obsessive with comics, and he's uh-huh. actually the one who got me into music. He was way into punk rock and all this stuff, and so uh, like. But I remember distinctly, like growing up and going to comic book stores with him and going to shows with him. Yeah. And he now owns a comic, uh, like a small comics publishing company out of New York. No kidding. Yeah, and writes and illustrates. And like he's, you know, he's got Robert a, Kirkman. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, his name's Dave Kelly. But uh, cool. yeah, he's got a he's got a little. Uh, I think he's up. It's like a five or six issue comic called Tales of the Night Watchman. Really? Yeah. So it's kind of cool. It's that very like. Cool detective era like comics yeah so, film noir kind of thing yeah or, uh, a little bit noir, yeah, yeah very much so very cool but uh you know it's like again this that whole like the life path like yeah. these are the things that he was way into when we were really little and like you know never thought that that was the direction we were going to take like right. he went and studied film and you know i went and studied music because i was going to go in air quotes <laughs> yeah in air quotes because i was going to go move out to la and i was going to become a record producer in air quotes. make it i was going to work gonna in it, sound man. city it's going to be so amazing i actually <laughs> did you do it? No, I didn't, tell, I didn't, I didn't work at Sound City, okay, okay. but I had a I had an internship set up at the Village Recording Studios. What the and shit, like, really? That was like, I was going to get out of college, and I was going to go do that, yeah. and that was going to be the thing out in Santa Monica. Oh my God, that's um, great. Yeah, well, it's okay, because I know something something must have happened. <laughs> yeah, and then it was like, I don't know, it was around the same time that I had just signed up, this was my last semester at college, yeah. and I just signed up for a documentary production class. Yeah, that's so looking good. into like photo and video. Yes. And Errol so Morris like, and stuff, DW Griffiths, like a documentary in that sense, like the old guys that were making. Um, no, it was actually it was pretty contemporary. Oh, was it? So it was looking at like some of some of the classics and some of the modern stuff too. Yeah. Um but the whole purpose was we had to produce a documentary by the end of the class. Mm-hmm. And so it was a very full, kind of, full length? Um or could it, no, ten to fifteen. Oh, that's good. Okay. So I mean short a little form, bit easier, but yeah. you know, something to kind of at least challenge us and 
challenged the working groups. And so we partnered into groups of like, well, you have editing experience and you've got audio experience. Yeah. And you've got video experience. So the de facto sound guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll compose the score and, you know, and I'll do all this recording in my. Do you guys my- like dark, ominous tones? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's put more ooh in there. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> Where's the pad setting on yeah, this cast? Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, it's, can I get more square over here? That'd be great. Um, but no, so it was around the same time that I actually met uh my wife uh and we started dating uh back oh, then cool. as well yeah and so like all these things were happening i was getting way into like photo and video and so shifting from like the auditory side of things yeah, over yeah. to the visual side of things um i was running a wine bar at the time too really well so it's I, man there's a lot of stuff to dig in here a lot sure. of stuff i particularly find interesting too so did you you had to have done the band thing oh of course i did the okay band and thing. you are I, there's I, some let me really... try to guess because you're an audio engineer you're friendly, so you can't be a drummer. Are you a drummer? No. Good, that's figured. Guitarist or bass? <laughs> you're friendly, so you're, yeah. I like it. Guitarist or bass? Probably. Guitarist. Yeah, okay, yeah. good, good, yeah. good. Which actually, I was sitting here, I was like, oh, Look man. <laughs> so I was I was telling the wife, I'm like, I'm, I need to buy a ukulele. Like, you don't understand, like, I really I want a need ukulele. one. I mean, just like, it just makes me so happy. Just yeah. like. They're cool, it's hard. The timbre it's cool. of it. It's beautiful. Yeah, like, I like it's it. Just, <laughs> it's just, I, it's all the strings are inverted and stuff, and it's yeah. like kind of hard to figure out the intervals on it, but you were you in a band you had to have been in yeah. a band like anything- I was gonna say, yeah good bad or otherwise i was in several bands yes i imagine uh my first band was in fifth grade and nice. and it was called the suicide needle oh i like it and that was with my buddy dave who now the comic <laughs> is guy. the comic guy yeah was um, he, is he what was he playing guitar too yeah we were both playing guitar and then right. our buddy ryan was on drums okay good you guys um, still talk you and ryan uh yeah actually ryan ryan moved up to kansas city and oh we, uh, really i don't see him too often but uh like we bumped into him just a couple of weeks ago. A friend moved up, and so we all pitched in to help move. And we're like, "Hey, you know what we should do? <laughs> we should totally set up the basement, man! Like reunite." But yeah, so <laughs> ironically, like the three of us, Dave, like we had—I don't remember what it was. We had some lovers spat of sorts between oh, the always, three of us, right? right? Well, fifth so, grade, it's hard, you know? right? And so Dave was like, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna f- go focus on writing." And we yeah. were like, "Cool, we're just gonna keep jamming." And so we set up in Ryan's basement, and it was like we were playing. A bunch of helmet, and Deftones, yeah. and like, uh, you know, sixth, seventh grade, and like yeah, just going nuts. Perfect. And uh, <laughs> and then we were like, but we can't call ourselves the Suicide Needle anymore. We need to call ourselves Lub. Lub? Yeah, so the next band was what? Lub. Um, but, was I it mean, Sludgy? Like, uh, <laughs> who am I thinking of? God damn it. Um, yeah, single note, kind of like Caius or something. A little bit. I yeah. mean, it was a little kind of caius It was very, if, if you took like some Nirvana, Alice in Chains, the grunge era, and uh-huh. then blended it with like the new metal-y Limp bizkit corn stuff. Because, oh, that I mean, sounds you gotta, real good. You know, I'm yeah. trying to remember, like, seventh grade for me was what, like, mid-90s. Yeah, so, so like Incubus, that was a big oh, one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Incubus. Incubus was huge. Snot? That was, oh, yeah. no, Snot was fantastic. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. God, um, taking me back. Yeah, so, but the, I mean, like, so those weren't the real bands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was the one otherwise? that, like, you know, kind of got you some acclaim, whatever that might um, be? There were two of them. There was one, my like, my freshman to sophomore year, in college it was called the unit okay and at that point that's when i was still pursuing my music major yeah uh, and so i was which, actually which studying college in case which kansas state kansas state so, okay um but i was pursuing jazz composition as Ooh. my major and yeah. the uh professor for the jazz department was actually a guitar player so i was like this is awesome great i was like i'm gonna go learn under this dude and i'm gonna study jazz composition um the problem is is that i i found note reading very challenging because i'd grown up oh, in the for world jazz of, too dude god grown up in the world of tabs and chords yeah, yeah. and like i understand it understood like transposing like shapes right, and things but, exactly um in any case so we ended up butting heads unfortunately and you know kind of going separate ways in that sense but uh the unit itself was it was like a blend of hip-hop jazz funk rock i mean kind of like interesting you familiar with the urge of course. Yeah. So if you took like the urge. Oh my God, that taking me back again. Yeah. The urge and through like a more intense hip hop, like uh, Jurassic 5 kind yeah. of thing underneath Wait, it, so. The urge, they weren't from. They're from St. Louis. Are they really? Yep. Man, I saw a guy. I saw them a bunch of times when I was younger. Yeah. Steve Ewing, the vocalist, was one of my absolute favorite. Like I was like, I'm doing, I'm totally going to mimic his style. That's I'm going to so sing cool. like Steve. And by the way, there is, you cannot sing like Steve. No, it's so, it's like, it's like a mix, <laughs> like a hybrid of like kind of fast singing, singing legato, like all that stuff, yeah. you know? That's good, man. That probably warped to I'm thinking ninety, probably ninety eight or something. Mm-hmm. So that you guys were taking off, or were, you, were you gaining some? Yeah, well, I mean, we we just we just did some stuff around Kansas, primarily Kansas mm-hmm. up to Kansas City, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we were hitting like little dive bars and venues and playing like, you know, sorority and fraternity like 
shows. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like really hitting the road and touring hard. Yeah. Um, but you know, we were getting at least some decent coverage yeah, locally yeah. and it was you know that was by far it was a serious passion project because all of the members um i think except for one were all music majors oh no kidding and so it was about as nerdy as we could get oh, dude, you yeah. know um and actually almost all of the other guys all but the non-music major are all now still playing music and pursuing it professionally really? yeah anybody you might know um I'm not sure uh the drummer is playing in a few jazz groups up in kansas Very city cool. okay um the bass player actually ended up switching over. He's now playing like one of those eight string Charlie Hunter uh-huh. guitars. And <laughs> yeah. he's he's been touring with some musicals. Uh, oh, wow. That's really but cool. Based out of Florida. And so um, it, it, there is some kind of turning point for you, though. And is this come, does this take us back to the documentary class where it kind of shifts from you performing? Or is that a little bit earlier? No, not necessarily. This was actually the, the breaking point, the shift point from that group was actually music driven yeah. more than anything. Okay. I'd, met a, I'd met a dude that was traveling around and he was like, look, man, he's like, I'm about to start up a new band. He's yeah. like, and I need a good backup guitarist. I need somebody who like knows what they're doing. He's like, I will pay you X amount of dollars per show. Yeah. Oh, he's nice. like, you know, signed endorsed by Sony and Ibanez and all this stuff. I was like, man, endorsements. I've never heard that word before. Right. That's they're crazy. paying you to do this. Yeah. Love it. Um, but unfortunately, so basically like I got really all, you know, really geeked out about that and, uh, kind of came back to the guys and I was like, listen, man, I feel like this is a great opportunity. I've got to take it. Like, yeah. you know, grab the bull by the horns kind of thing. I'm going to take a semester off of college. You know, like that whole thing. Um, man, it was a serious thing then. And then it bottomed out. I mean, so basically oh, I, shit, I committed really? to it. I burned all these bridges in a lot of ways. And then it was just like, <gasps> oh, no. And then I was just left here like, oh, Pants man, what did your I just do? Kind of yeah. thing. Jesus. What ha- like, what did it just all this stuff fall through or he didn't follow through with you or what happened exactly? It turned out he didn't have nearly the level of commitments that he was kind of leading on that he did. Oh, I see. And he was just dragging his feet through the whole process. Oh, man. You know, so it was like, as far as like, he made it sound like he had all these tunes written and it was yeah. a matter of like, here's some lead sheets and just like, you know, do it. Right. That'll be it. And it was a matter of like, nope nothing's written he wanted like he wanted me to be involved in the writing process and i'm like man like wow, okay. this is a much bigger commitment and you know it seems like it's gonna be a much longer commitment than we were discussing because yeah, like yeah, to yeah. go on tour for like six months is That's one a thing long time man but to like to be in the writing process for like a year leading up to a tour for six yeah, months and is, i can't imagine uh, you guys you know you talk about splitting splitting copy the rights the publishing rights and stuff. oh yeah i mean you got there's a lot of intricacies there which kind of become yeah. a problem so you bring <laughs> I mean, I'm not laughing because it's funny, but it's like, God damn it. Yeah. You got to be just kind of shit. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, because you're just like, man, all my butt. And like the band continued. Yeah. Like they went on, you know, oh. and like there was no way I was going to go and be like, hey, guys, could I like come back and play guitar with you guys again? And they turned into um, you too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, so they had a they had a guest guitarist come in for a little while uh, who is another buddy of ours in the jazz program who is now actually probably the most famous musician that I know. Really? Um, he plays in a group called the Floozies. Okay. Uh, his name's know. Matt Hill. Yeah. But you should check them out. They're pretty cool. Like very, very uh, jazz funk influence. But then they blend in like a whole bunch of like electronic, just crazy like pads. Interesting. And, okay. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's cr- some pretty cool stuff. But, but did you, did you kind of at that point, did you resent any of those decisions? Or you're kind of like, well, I guess this is yeah, pushing me absolutely. forward. Absolutely. That was my, that was my first time into therapy. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> But I mean, like, you know, because looking you know, at it, the bottom of a bottle, it's talking. just like, what am I doing, man? What right. did I do to my life? Like, how, how old like, are you talking? When um, you're... how old would I have been? Probably nineteen, twenty. Oh, okay, okay. So, so I still, mean, like, like plenty of time oh, yeah. to do a bunch of stuff, okay. but just like hormonal conflicted enough that you're just like, what did I do? I've right. destroyed my whole life. Can't you know? see the forest from the trees. No, not there, at all. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, and so like, but thankfully, I had a lot of really good friends. And, yeah. Uh, got signed back up in school. Um, at that point, like I was committed to, I was like, well, I'm not going to do the music major side of things. Yeah. Like, and I actually bounced around. I ended up having six majors total through college. Really? Before I found my way back to mass common journalism. Um, but, you know, it's like, I, I was like, well, I don't know. Mom always wanted me to be like an engineer, like a, a pharmacist. So I started studying pharmacy for a while and it was wow. not at all. But <laughs> would your, I mean, but your dad was still the entrepreneur restaurateur, right? Yeah. So my dad, my dad had actually passed away when I was five. Oh, wow. And okay. so I, my dad had already created this epic legacy. Like a legacy, right? I mean, you know, to the point of like, there were, there were Facebook groups dedicated to some of his bars and restaurants wow. that have been like, wow, this is so amazing. Like, 
So, you know, here's this dude that I kind of knew for a few years, but right. in my adult life, I've never really got to know. But, yeah, like, yeah. seeing his impact is still just, like, super impactful. And did you always have a place in the business if you wanted it? Absolutely. Because yeah. um, was know, it family run at all after he passed? It was family run. My mom was an airline stewardess. Okay. Um, and so, and she was actually primarily an international airline stewardess. Oh, and wow. so she would fly for a week. Yeah. and be gone and then come back to Topeka and watch me for a week. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of bounced back and forth between my two aunts. But she was at the same time running his his last standing restaurant. Wow. And so it's just like, you know, here you, you take somebody yeah. who has no expertise in the hospitality restaurant world. You know, it wasn't by, it, like, you know, it wasn't anything she had ever wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but she felt committed to like, I have to keep this place running. Um, you know, so I mean, for me, from like the age of like seven on, I was in that restaurant. Wow. You know, I mean, so you're it's it's ingrained. Yeah, like you you know hospitality, you understand people, customers, all that. It's I mean, again, no surprise that you end up in this kind of industry. <laughs> back where I'm know? at, yeah, yeah. But you head back to school, more focused. Mm-hmm. Everything is aligned back, and you're doing mass calm, and you still mm-hmm. kind of music always will call you back. Yeah. Right? So I was now playing with another band. <laughs> So it ironically, like another a good buddy of mine was still hanging out. He's like, "Listen, man, he's like, if you just want to get together and jam and like write some tunes," and I was like, "Yeah, yeah actually, that'd be really good." Like, Therapeutic, in yeah, a way, right? completely. And so we started playing, and my uh, the drummer buddy actually ended up saying, "He's like, well, you know, he's like, yeah, I can totally play between the two groups. Like, yeah, it's whatever. We've you know, we've got gigs here and there." And he's like, "I would," he's like, "It's better practice for me too," mm-hmm. um, because we were this new group. We were wanting to go way less jazz focused, okay. funk focused, and way more kind of you know, helmet, alien ant farm, yeah, inky yeah, this, yeah. like yeah. more into the progressive Rocky, but like alternative progressive yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so he was like, that would be a great challenge for me as mm. a musician, you know, to play something different. It's almost restraining yourself, yeah. you know, which is good. I think it's good for songwriting purposes. So, especially. and then we played in that group and again, just kind of toured around the Kansas, Missouri area uh, for about two and a half years. Mm. And that was called pineapple truck. <laughs> There are some really <laughs> fantastic recordings that exist out in the digital, of digital ether. Pineapple of truck. pineapple truck. Good. So, <laughs> I uh, well, who's to say if I'll find one and post it? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows what oh, kind of time Lord. I have on my hand? <laughs> My G's we'll like, I don't know what, what, what may come of these things. Let's see. Well, maybe I'll remaster it and release it, and it'll be a big event. Forever. It'll be amazing. <laughs> so it's good. So obviously, music is calling your name. That's just why. Yeah, Man, so yeah. I find my way back, and you know I'm in mass common journalism. Yeah, um, so I've now actually found a major that complements me in the sense of it challenges me creatively, mm-hmm. but it's got enough technical kind of aspect to it that yeah. it still kind of fulfills that. Like I need to like you know look at numbers and tinker with things. Yeah, um, and I was running a wine bar in Manhattan, Kansas. Okay, at the time, and that's really that wine bar is where, like, if I was to put the flag in the ground of like, right, right, right. where my perspective on the industry shifted, it was while I was there. How, about, how old were you when you were working at um, Twenty one. Okay, I mean, so right, right, right at the yeah. right at right at that age where it's like you can start learning things, and so it was already, you know, it was already an award winning wine bar okay. in the sense of like Wine Spectator had thrown a couple of, you know, really uh, award so it's good, good place, to, good pedigree in the place. Yeah, yeah, completely. You know, and I was like, I don't understand wine. I want to learn about wine. That's cool. Um, and it's brief aside. Do you not find like spirits, wine, food, all like harmonies, all like songs, all absolutely like chords? And once you kind of absolutely. think about chords. And you kind of understand music. You're like, well, this is a triad, three beautifully balanced notes, right? Mm-hmm. Then you understand why a gimlet works. You yeah. understand why a martini works. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, bass, me, in trouble. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that gives us this unique perspective on spirits. Not better or not worse, but just a nice kind of template mm-hmm. to apply, like a framework to apply for flavor. I completely agree. So I can understand why wine would be particularly intriguing. Yeah. Right? It's the same kind of thing. You know, it's the same idea of you take two instruments that have the exact same timbre. Yeah. And you put them in the appropriate, like, scenario where they're fighting against one another. But yeah. what you end up getting is actually, like, something better exactly. in the end. And yeah. it's, you know, to me, like, that's that's bitter and bitter. Yeah. You know, it's the idea of, like, man, I can take Fernet and Campari, put it together, and I actually get something that is, like, holy crap. Elevated, that was yeah. substantially Crazy. different. Yeah, you, you know? would never think. And no. In, in, a, in a sense, like, if you think about, it's almost just, like, not allowing jazz to exist. But mm-hmm. jazz always somehow creates order out of this dismay. You know, in my opinion, even though perhaps it sounds busy at times. 
<laughs> and looking at the notes, I can imagine why you're uh, like, fuck this. I'm not uh, reading this. Yeah. I can barely read. All- oh, <laughs> and then I have five different places I can play it. Yeah. Oh, oh like, no, what am I going to I need some uh, just slightly more structure. Yes. <laughs> slightly exactly. more structure there. Strip it down. Just um, fill it down. So, yeah, like I, the wine bar, a good experience, and you're kind of starting to really peak or wet your whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the chef owner was very challenging, and yeah. you know, uh, so I, that's also where I met my wife. Oh, good. so my wife was a waitress there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you shouldn't date the staff. Well, <laughs> sorry, I dated the staff. Um, it turned if it, if you guys hadn't gotten married, yeah, bigger deal than it is. But it's hey, true. Aw, look I know. That, you know. Um, but no, it was great because you know we were we often joke that he challenged us more than we were challenged in our. Like in our academics, studies. oh yeah, just yeah. because he, you know, he required the staff to take monthly tests. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he had over seven hundred bottles of wine. He wow. had eighty by the glass. Um, you know, we had like one hundred twenty different beers, uh, and then we had you know, almost like two hundred some spirits on the back bar. And it was it, it was one of those. It's you know, he always explained. He's like, look, it's not about giving somebody just a great glass of wine, yeah, and it's not about giving somebody just a great like meal, right? It's right. about understanding how those two things come together mm-hmm. plus the experience you add to it that ultimately gives them something that's greater than the sum of their parts yeah amazing you know it's so exactly. it's like you have the right wine with the right dish and it's that whole high holy shit factor of yeah. just like oh man those things are coming together beautifully totally like a so. piece of chocolate if you're drinking cognac right mm-hmm. it's like oh this cognac is amazing or mm-hmm. armagnac for preferably and then you just take a piece of chocolate all of a sudden your mind's even blown further yeah because it's it's like it unleashes these other sensors and you yeah. can start really, really getting into something more deep than you ever thought. Yeah. And that's amazing that you had such like a playground in a way. Right? No, it was so fantastic. And so how long were you there? <laughs> um, I was there for about three, three years or so. Yeah. That's like, perfect. So like early twenties, three years at a, at a Mecca probably yep. in, in Topeka. Anyway. Well, in, in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah, so sorry. what was the, the most, the, the, the kind of defining moment the chef owner approached me and he said, I want, he's like, I want you to, we just had the bar manager leave because he mm. graduated college and he was like, look, you know, they brought in a consulting group and the consulting group was like, you should promote this guy. Yeah. He pointed to me. Hey, all right. Here's some money like, to okay, tell me to do that. You know? Yeah. Cool. Um, and then the chef owner was like, okay, well, I mean, they said you should be promoted. So I guess this is your new job. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we want to, we want to develop a new bar program. Mm-hmm. He's like, you know, I want you to look at uh, classic cocktails. And so I was like, okay, cool. And like classic cocktails, that's like the 40s, like the 40s and 50s, right? Right. And so, you know, of course, I'm diving into things like the pink squirrel and yeah, like yeah. trying to dig up these weird esoteric drinks from the 40s and 50s where everything What's is- What's this martini? <laughs> it's like basically a bunch of, like a lot of the cocktails just red like bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I started digging deeper onto the onto the, the, the depths of the internet and started finding all the stuff that was going on in New York and Dave mm-hmm. Wondrich had just published in Bibe and, or like was about to publish yeah, yeah. in Bibe. Um, Lush Life Productions was like just starting to do some video coverage Amazing. of these things, yeah. um, and then I found uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the forum now, but it was it, it's like one forum was like the treasure trove of information, uh-huh. and it was like holy shit, there are the, all these recipes from like the late 1800s, and right, like right. wow, this is nuts. Like, um, and so we pushed the cocktail program there to try and go, you know, what nowadays is you know kind of germane in the sense of like craft cocktail, like. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, back but then it's like, this was, you know, 2005, I mean, that's 2005, 2006 yeah, for sure. Um, and so, I mean, like I have to give, I have to give the chef credit because for one, and by the way, the place is called four olives wine bar oh, Okay. because okay. he was like, you know, it's like three olives. He's like, no, it's the fourth olive. Like we're one olive better because you know everybody was way into dirty <laughs> martinis and that was the thing. And if I remember correctly, he was wasted on dirty martinis when he was inspired to open the place. You know, that makes a lot but, of sense. In any case, uh, no, I mean, like, thankfully, he was willing to be like, all right, sure, let's give it a shot. Yeah. You know, like, so we we put a Martinez on the menu, and we had a Sazerac on the mm-hmm. menu, and we had, you know, like, we did, like, an actual, like, fresh metal Caipirinha. And yeah. This, you yeah. know, again, like, 2005, Cachaça wasn't even, like, a whisper. And I can't even say it right in 2005. <laughs> especially in Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah. Like, so, you know, it, you it was... You had a little movement going on, it feels Yeah, like. it, was, it was challenging. And, I mean, like, there were some, there were some really cool things. And then later... It's so like, you know, as this all moves forward, um, and actually we probably launched that menu more in like 2006, 2007 ish. Still, I mean, it's um, right on the brink of all this stuff blowing up. Yeah. But the wife, uh, the girlfriend at the time had bought tickets for me to go visit my buddy Dave in New York. Okay. Uh, as a surprise for like, uh, it was like an anniversary gift or a birthday gift. I can't yeah, recall. Yeah. But so we planned this trip in April of 2008, I believe. 
And, you know, at this point, I had been studying and reading about all this cocktail right. culture. And actually and executing, like, too. Yeah, and now it's like, and now I'm going to New York. Yeah. I'm going from Manhattan, Kansas, the Little Apple, to Manhattan, New York, the Big Apple. You know what I mean? That Manhattan sounds so cheesy, Manhattan. but it's just like... It is. It, it was is. a. It was like a huge impactful deal for, for me at sure. the time. Had you um, had you traveled around that much before? No, not yeah. really. I mean, I had been just mostly visiting family here yeah. and there, but not really like exploring the world. And yeah. so this was also my first like foray into a a big city, yeah. being New York, but b like taking of like a trip as you know as an adult yeah. and not having my parents there. And oh, like, good. so it was this whole like, all right, I'm finally like, you know, 23 years old. I'm going to get out there and go see what this is like mm-hmm. and go out and visit my buddy Dave. And, you know, I had already been following like Audrey Saunders and uh-huh. Pegu club. And I was like, all right, we have to go to Pegu club. This place is looks so legit. Like yeah, I'm yeah. so inspired by all this stuff. And this is actually where I had my cocktail epiphany. Okay. Because my approach to cocktails had been very kind of like all just, just, uh, you know, just writ- like written, just it's, yeah. it was all like cerebral instead of guttural. I always yeah, think to of that, agree. like yeah. less practical yeah. and more theoretical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so getting out there and I remember sitting down at the bar and having having a conversation. You know, we went two nights that we were there. First night we went in and I was talking with the bartender and I was asking, him, I was like, well, I don't know. You know, like I'm I, I, I'm really interested in these things. What what would you make? Like, what would you drink right now? Yeah, what should yeah. I drink? He's like. I'll take care of you. Didn't ask me anything. He just said, I'll take care of you. And he made me the most elegantly, you know, built old fashioned I'd ever experienced. Yeah. You know, it's just like where he like zested the, uh, you know, like basically squeeze some orange zest into right, the glass right. first and then like muddled a little bit and then, you know, stirred until one ice cube is fully dissolved and then put a little bit more booze, another ice cube, let it half dissolve and yeah, then stirred wow. it a little bit more. Like it was just, a very it was a process. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, like I have not thought about the details of the technique that go yeah, into this yeah. um and then the next night when we went back i was talking with another bartender and i was like well you know what would you recommend i try he was like oh you have to try the paquito picante okay and this was one of those like you know when you if you want to talk about how the olfactory sense is like deeply ingrained in you yeah this is the like this drink will always be a flavor memory for me okay um but it was um if i remember correctly it's gin cointreau uh lemon juice uh sorry lime juice, um, muddled jalapeno, cilantro, cucumber, um, and then like a little bit of a uh, uh, simple syrup. But it was like, wow, okay. it was just that marriage of like, you basically take oh, like ceviche, uh-huh. you yeah, know, exactly. but then you like, it's, it's dried out with gin, you know? So like my, my immediate like response was, whoa, I've never like, I didn't know I could put cilantro in a cocktail, right? Exactly. you know, cause I was looking at these pre-prohibition era recipes no i was knew, like no white people knew what cilantro was until the <laughs> 90s right like, right <laughs> you mean i can go into the kitchen and take things that's <laughs> weird <laughs> like, yeah so that was you know after that after that experience i came back i was like you know scott we have to rewrite the entire menu like we've got You're we got to do like, all these new things yeah culinary and, for, forward right yeah and it pushed it really pushed me hard into the like i want to know more about all the details of yeah. this um at the same time, I'm taking this documentary class and I'm like, you know, what would be the coolest thing ever would be to be able to like travel around and like do documentary video coverage with all these bartenders and distilleries and just like learn the whole craft. Right. I see the, the plot thickening. Yeah, <laughs> completely. Like it's basically whether I knew it or not, like yeah. I basically said, you know, I put it out in the universe, whatever that like, that's what I want to do and that's what I will do. And yeah. that's effectively kind of where I'm at right Amazing. now. Amazing. Okay. But graduated college moved to kansas city um was bartending at a wine bar down there you know because i was like i need to find a similar experience and it wasn't they were doing a great job but it was not nearly the same you know it was it was in a very uh suburban area where they were kind of catering to the lowest common denominator rather than trying to push the bar yeah um you know we had three cosmo we had two cosmos on the menu that were the exact same drink Uh but named different at different price points why so it just never it didn't even matter study of marketing man yeah that's so strange um but yeah, and so I ended up reaching out to this guy named Ryan Maybe, who was going to be opening up. Like there was an article written because I was trying to. F- I remember. I remember how this all worked. I was trying to find Regans and Peychauds okay. in Kansas City, and I was like, seriously, I was able to get it for my bar in Manhattan, Kansas. Why can't I find this stuff up in Kansas City? Yeah, wow. And so I was hopping on the internet, like looking for Kansas City Regans, Kansas City Peychauds, and there was an article that had just been p- published like an hour earlier because I was just getting off shift. Uh-huh. Um, 
and it was like, you know, new bar owner is making his own bitters, you know, and then there was a recipe for Peychaud's, and I was like, wait, what's going on? Like, who wait, is, I can do? Who, wait, who is this motherfucker? Yeah. Like, I'm going to find you. I must know these things, you know. <laughs> I will learn from you. Um, you saw some kind of, like, warning flare. And yeah. Like, I got to go to that. I got to figure out where, you know. <laughs> and then I was like, and I will now commence Facebook stalking. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> so I call it dossier building. Dossier building, <laughs> indeed. Here, here, here's your file, sir. <laughs> I've right, compiled this right. over the last two and a half months. I promise I'm not creepy and, uh, and i'm um, sorry about the breakup <laughs> <laughs> sorry i know things were weird um but yeah no so we i actually i facebook stalked ryan for about two and a half two and a half months and i was literally sending him messages every day just like wow. questions about things like well hey what about this what about this because i'd found out he had just taken the bar five day oh, okay you know and i was like oh man like i really want to take that too you know and so we were just kind of reaching out to having these conversations of how do you make bitters? Like, how do you know Audrey Saunders? Yeah, like, Oh, do yeah. you know so-and-so? And like, have you made this? Or like, if you were going to do this, how would you do that? Like, you know, you became your mentor. Yeah, completely. Um, and at this time I was actually fulfilling my degrees equivalent of things. And yeah. I had a day job, uh, doing front end web design Ooh. for a social network. So I was doing a whole bunch of like CSS and yeah. JavaScript and see again though, that building the code and kind of, having that balance and making sure that parentheses are closed completely like it all cocktail, it all ties in it, totally it does. all ties in and yeah. like the the logic arcs are very yeah you know it's so strange like sometimes i've talked to people I'm like are we the same person yeah, yeah. It's, like, so it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a little weird yeah. it's gonna be a little weird um we'll do some freaky what is it no the parent trap is that where the kids switch or is it freaky friday we'll just switch one time <laughs> we'll, we'll like clink some glass and then all of a sudden i'll be up in your life like I could probably just, let me yeah. try to do this. I think I could do. This. I could. I could handle this. Yeah, I, man. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a four. Yeah. So, so then, uh, then so we you, get to about two thousand and two thousand and eight. Yeah. And so no, two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. And you still talking no, 2000, to Ryan? Two thousand nine. Man, I'm all over the place. But but somewhere near yeah. south. Of Ryan Ryan or, convinces me to leave the wine bar that I was working at. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, by the way, just in case anybody's listening to this, it happens to Ryan's history. Ryan used to own a wine bar. The wine bar that I worked at was a different wine bar. Interesting. So okay, so no connection. There. No connection there. But uh, uh, yeah, no, so he convinced me to leave the wine bar that I was at because he was going to be opening up this new craft cocktail speakeasy joint. Yeah. And I remember like one of the first sit down meetings we had was, well, let's sit down and talk about this place. And I was like, as he's describing it, I, I pulled out like my moleskin and I was like, dude, I have notes for this exact place. Oh my gosh. Like I want to do, like I wanted to do like custom sized ice. Where, yeah, you yeah. Know, and like that was one of the main things and having cold draft in the city, like no one had cold draft in Kansas city. Yeah. Um, and so it was getting like, you know, he basically said, well, why don't you come work at this restaurant with me? And, you know, we're going to be opening up manifesto in the basement of it. Oh, wow. Um, and so that's kind of, I got in on the opening staff there and, you know, and I was there from about April of 2009 until about October. So, really? And this is this is the other big like well this is like the place like this was like the core passion center of what you yeah, wanted to be all doing starts somewhere it feels like that's why'd you leave like yeah you know did you, you were get there pregnant? yeah I, I did I uh <laughs> I got pregnant I was having a baby um no I mean to be honest what what ended up happening was um an opportunity presented itself for me to start doing more photo and video work okay. And I had, you know, made that little commitment to myself a few years back. I was like, all right, if this can happen, like, I want to go do this. Yeah. Did you see it as um, being kind of a more long-term career, that industry over the bartending thing? No, not no. at all. But just, you just made that vow, though. That yeah, it's it. like, I wanted to pursue that. And, you know, having the degree in journalism as well, yeah. it was very much, the, the thing that I feel they really taught me in school was, more than anything else, was like, understand how to tell a story mm-hmm. with you know, the things that you're using. So like with photo, with video. Right, right. Um, and I saw that there was a distinct gap in the amount of documentation that was going on in the industry uh-huh. of just like, you know, I had met all these bartenders that were doing all these things and nobody was really like, there wasn't, nobody was putting stuff out yeah. about it, you know. No one was chronicling it. No one was being a loud voice about it. Yeah. No one was chronicling it. It wasn't documented. That was a problem from back pre-prohibition right, too. Right. It's just like, what are these recipes? Right, and somehow know. there's like this iron curtain of communication all of a sudden. You're like, wait, there's like this blackout period. Yeah. No one knows shit about it, even though everybody saw it. But yep. No one paid for it. So that's brilliant. So I think I can see where this is going, but tell me um, how you started this endeavor of. So, you know, I filed for an LLC. I was like, I'm going to do a f- just some freelance gigs here and there. And I had a couple like little like photo shoots in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I basically put it out to literally everybody I knew that, hey, I'm doing this thing. 
Um, you know, the one area I didn't know much about was the video side of things. Mm-hmm. And so I started following a bunch of blogs and just, you know, Oh, to- you learned how to do it. I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure. Thanks internet. Um, <laughs> but so I ended up reaching out to, uh, there's a cinematographer named Shane Hurlbutt. Um, Great name. great name. I know. Great name, name, right? Are you sure he's not a porno star? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So he was the uh, <laughs> cinematographer for uh, the la- like one of the last Terminator movies, like Terminator Salvation. Ooh, yeah. Uh, Need for Speed. Nice. Um, but what was really important was he was championing the camera. It was a Canon 5D Mark II. Okay. As like, you can use this not just as a photography camera, but like you could legitimately use this as a, film. a full film camera. Really? And I had just bought this camera like three months earlier. Yeah. So I was like, I own this camera. Like I, I could make film, you yeah, know, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and so I harassed him just enough, uh, to the point I was driving. I, I remember this pretty distinctly too. I was driving around Kansas city and I got a phone call from a California number. And I was like, California, like who's like, is my family calling me? What's yeah, going on? Yeah. Um, picked it up and it was like, Hey Brandon, this is Lydia Hurlbutt. I was like his wife. Okay. And I was like, uh, hi, what, can I help you? Like, yeah. <laughs> like how I, I know I put my like mobile number on like my mailing address, right, but like, right. I didn't actually expect like somebody was randomly going to call me. And she was like, well, Hey, I was just curious. It was like a Tuesday. She was like, you know, we've got a shoot this weekend for Canon. Um, and we didn't know if you would be in the California area. If you would like to come out and work the shoot with us. Oh, wow. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like come we're, out and work in LA in LA. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in Kansas City at this time. So right. I'm like, uh, I have no plans of being in California this weekend. <laughs> yeah, but. California. All right. <laughs> and so I remember like, I was like, you know, I, I really appreciate it, but I don't know if I can make it work. And I hung up. I drove another block and I was like, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this was like literally opportunity yeah, staring yeah, me in yeah. the face. And I was like, fuck that. It was so I calling ca- you. Yeah, I yeah. called her right back. And I said, Lydia, I'm sorry. Tell you what, I'm looking into it right now. I will figure it out. I will see you this weekend. Yeah. Um, I ended up dropping like it was close to like two and a half grand on that trip because it was like God. last minute flights, last right, minute right. hotels, last minute rental car. Um, but I was like, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to not just see this guy work, but to actually work with, with him, him on totally a project. Different deal, yeah. Um, and I mean, like we got to work with like the pyro special effects team that worked on Transformers. Oh, wow. we, it, it was it was a crazy experience. Yeah. But you know, and doing a shoot for Canon, I was like. At the end of it, I came back and I was like, I can't, I can actually make some serious stuff with this camera. Yeah. Like, I feel very confident in this now. Was he shooting on that one? Though? He was shooting on that camera. Oh, cool. So you're learning how to, yeah. how to leverage it anyhow. Yep. And then I had my camera with me, like, yeah. on site because I'm like, well, I'm going to, like, take photos of this and document parts of this, yeah, too, of just for shits and giggles. Um, but yeah, and then it was about, I got back and it was about a week later, uh, Ryan from Manifesto uh-huh. reached out and he was like, hey, so I'm going to go do this thing at the Manhattan Cocktail Classic. It's the inaugural one 2010 like in new york and yeah. he's like and uh rumor has it that their videographer just fell through oh, so they have nobody to shoot it and i was like well i'll go shoot it and I'll, <laughs> it'll bring pyrotechnics <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> it'll blow things up <laughs> probably not the best way to sell it um <laughs> but yeah so i was like well i'll come shoot it and she was like you know well, i really don't have budget i was like that's fine that's fine. I will come shoot it. Yeah. Just so long as I don't have to pay for anything once I'm up there. Right, right. You know, I'll stay at my buddy's place in Brooklyn and then I will just like just make sure I get into things. Yeah. And that ended up that was a huge turning point for me in the sense of I met tons of people in the industry in that oh, moment. Yeah. And you're and, like interacting with them in a deep kind of an intimate way. Yeah. And in particular, that's when I met Lindsay Johnson from Lush Life. Yeah. And that was like now the next three years of my life began. Like at that moment. Amazing. Um but yeah, and so then it was like, and now I'm getting, you know, and then I was getting to travel around with Lindsay and go document cocktail festivals. So and, were you working for Lush Life? Mm-hmm. So I I've didn't been, know that. Yeah, and in fact, like the last project that I shot with them, uh, we did a series of videos for the Tank Rage Institute. Yeah, it was uh, uh, Angus at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and like the most recent ones are like with Hidetsugu Ueno and like yeah. Ueno's son and like, so flew out to California and kind of interviewed him and talked about the uh, Japanese bar, approach bar to bartending. Time, right? mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was the one time I went there, he wasn't there. Yeah. I'm <laughs> no, so sad. Like, no, he was probably in California doing the shoot with me. Son of a bitch. Because <laughs> again, see, I'm just saying, man. Like, I know, dude. Yeah, Freaky Friday. <laughs> Let's just switch. You can go into work this goes. morning, and then no. Okay, um, it. So great. So you you become the resident videographer. Is that fair? Um, to or, a degree. I mean, I I was I was getting called up for a lot of their pet projects. Yeah. Um, you know, which was awesome, and. Through that, uh, I got to shoot the inaugural Pig and Punch, oh, yeah. Tales of the Cocktail, and oh. that's where I met Josh Harris and Scott Baird, the you know the Bon Vivants. Yeah, the Bon Vivants. Um, 
you know, and those guys are now easily some of my best friends in the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, and just like we got, you know, I, I can't thank Lindsay enough because I would not be as deeply, you know, involved in the industry yeah. were it not for her as well. I call um, her, and I think she was okay with this term, but I called her the, the matchmaker. Yeah. Because she just knows. It's like, hey, if I'm going to a place that I don't know anybody, uh-huh. like Vancouver, for example, I went, I guess, a couple of years ago now, and I'm like, hey, going to this place? Uh-huh. Where should I go in this place? And she's okay, like, got say exactly hi to like Billy from so and so and this from so and so until Lindsay tell him Lindsay said hi. Yeah. And like, no, it's it's I've done exactly the same thing and it's beautiful. It's, cr- <laughs> it's amazing. And and I've met some of the most lovely people mm-hmm. through her because somehow she just understands us. She's so you know, and there's always the L the LJ kind of part of conversations for yeah. people that know her, you know, and it's like she just understands how to connect people, but connect the right people. Yeah, you know completely. what I mean? Because she's like, ah, Mike's personality is probably like this, blah, blah blah. So when she starts the millionaire matchmaking service <laughs> and, and usurps that lady that's on Bravo or whatever, yeah. I won't be, I won't even flinch. I'll know it's coming. Oh yeah, it's it, totally it, coming, and it will be perfect. It'll be so, and good. it will be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that that cut spot, whatever the hell you would call that. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my favorite descriptions of Lindsay uh, came from Leslie Townsend. So Leslie, and I can't recall Lindsay, Leslie's, uh, Townsend is her maiden, maiden name. Mm-hmm. I don't remember her married name. She just got married about a year and a half okay. ago. But she was the founder of the Manhattan Cocktail Classic. Oh, cool. Um, and she had once commented to me, you know, because I had mentioned that I was going to start doing some work with Lush Life, yeah. you know, because Leslie was by far my first client getting to shoot the, the MCC for her. Unfortunately, we weren't able to use any of the footage. Ah, just, okay. There wasn't there wasn't enough of a story arc. Got and, it, got it. You know, because I was still learning my trade. Sure, sure. Um, but again, huge opportunity. But I mentioned to Leslie that I was going to start working with Lindsay. Um, and she was like, that woman is an absolute dynamo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like, seriously, she is phenomenal. Just the amount that she, like, the productivity that she exudes is just... Well, she's, yeah, super productive. Yeah, completely. It's just, it's, so it's, it's pretty astounding. And, you know, I thought... I was like, man, a dynamo. Like, that's a really interesting way to describe her. I haven't like, even heard that word in her. years. It's brilliant. And, like, when I first, like, actually got to spend some time with Lindsay, I was like, I get it. Because, like, as you're going around with her, she's immediately like, okay, you, 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 this, this. And it's just, you know, it's just, like, pointing the and, like, things are just manager, happening. Dude. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's, it's really, really astounding, like mm-hmm. you said. And it's brilliant. And so you, you said you were doing that for about three years. I which, did that for about three years. Is that what led you into ultimately now this next chapter in your life or did you have another to a degree there was kind of a a bridging of sorts so it was 2000 and in 2012 when we were down there uh shooting pig and punch and everything as well um you know so i think that was like the second or third year of pig and punch yeah, but yeah. um we were filming that and then i remember talking with uh a good friend of mine cc norman okay um, and Cece lives in Houston. Okay. Um, she helped run Okra for a good oh, while cool. and works with Bobby and all those guys out yeah. there. But Cece was like, hey, uh, you know, I'm starting to work on this new project called the Tequila Interchange Project. Oh, wow. Would love, you know, like you totally need to come by, like see some of the stuff that they're doing. And I was like, cool. And she's like, oh, and I have a T-shirt. And she had shown me one of these shirts that they were making earlier. And I was like, I totally have to have that shirt. Yeah. That's such a cool shirt. I must own that shirt. And she was like, well, yeah, just come by. Uh, We're doing this thing with one of the like tequila brands. It's Mm -hmm. pretty deeply involved with it. Uh, It's at, you know, it's called Viva Sangrita. It's at DBA. Yeah, yeah. Like, so come on by. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll go check this thing out. And so I remember stepping into DBA in New Orleans, which if you love that bar, yeah, it's phenomenal, right? Like, it's an amazing bar. I had been there like venue too. I had been there like two nights earlier to see a show. Yeah, exactly. Kind of packed. I walked into Viva Sangrita and it was like totally, totally like I could barely squeeze through the room. Um, and I was like, what the hell's going on? And I finally find CC, get my like, you know, Agave Asavita shirt, yeah. uh, which is still one of my absolute favorite t-shirts. I almost wore it over this morning, um, <laughs> but I was like, no, I got to support my Royals today. Um, and, and like, as I'm walking out, somebody slapped a mini of Tequila Ocho into my hand. Oh, and I mean, man. this is, and this is another epiphany of sorts, yeah, right? Yeah, and so yeah. I tasted it and I was like, I have never had tequila like this before. Right. Like this is completely different. It's eye-opening I was like, for sure. Yeah. And why is there a vintage on this bottle? That's weird. Yeah. Like you have, like, why is the year on here? Um, so anyway, so like I had it, I became obsessed with it. I was like, this stuff is delicious. Why can't, like, is this in Missouri? Why, yeah. why isn't this in Missouri? Like, it's just like the this should be, thing, right? Yeah, You're completely. Like, well, how do I get this it This should be in Missouri. Um, and so for like the next year, I was slowly doing some research about it and trying to understand like, how do you get a product set up? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. who are good distributors to work with and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then 2013, I got, I, you know, I was one of 
uh, about 17 folks that got to go down on this trip to Ricea, ah. to go down with Misty and Amazing, with yeah. Phil Ward and all these guys and uh, uh, basically go pal around the, uh, you know, the mountains of Jalisco or like the, mm. the hills right. of Jalisco. And uh, in many ways, that was a very life changing life affirming trip that i was like there is so much more here in this culture that like oh we have no just idea. gets completely like, overlooked and yeah. as somebody who like really you know at this point was really digging in deep and really appreciating so much of it it's yeah. just like man like i get what i do on a regular basis has value for right. brands or for you know festivals and things like that i was like but this can have direct impact and value on these people's lives and culture like, yeah, it's a humanitarian is, thing well and, sense, and you, know? you know as a documentarian too like you want to talk about oh, something yeah. that is totally undocumented like as i was trying to do research on ricea before the trip yeah like there are barely there were barely even blogs written about it back then yeah. you know and so it's just like and there's no like detailed information to understand it because clearly culturally they're not going to you know they're not well, going to spend the, their time documenting and writing down all these things right it's just you know? a way of life right exactly it's, this is how we, my father did it. That's how his father did it. That's exactly. how eight it's a, generations did it. It's like, oh, big deal. Yeah. But it's just what it's what you do. Like, yeah. it's kind of like us running water, right? Exactly. We just have it. Okay, cool. Yeah. You know, but if you don't have it, it's a profound fucking thing. Yeah. You know, and it, it is. It's all just about subjectivity and you where, where you come from. So mm-hmm. it does take that kind of perspective, that Western perspective and going right. down there and saying, man, this is really worth diving into. And, mm-hmm. and it's so romantic, too, even Absolutely. though there's terrible poverty mm-hmm. and like all these other kinds of dark sides to it but still from a filmmaker perspective yeah rich, i mean there's just there's rich. exactly and there's just a level of purity with it yeah you know and it's just like it's pure it's untouched it's like you know it's the idea where <laughs> we're coming from like the nerdy bartender's perspective of like yeah. well, what kind of agaves are you using in this and they're right. like the ones that grow over here like yeah. you know smell like, it taste it I yeah mean, that changes them we talk about olfactory senses mm-hmm. and kind of muscle memory and all that I mean, with the cilantro and the cucumber thing that's those spent agave fibers, and I don't know if it's the same in Lisco, but I, I believe it is, that are just out there mm-hmm. and getting really sour, and that smell just wafts, and that lactic acid and all this stuff, and it's like, you can't forget that. Mm-hmm. And anytime you drink something, and it, if you talk about Reseer or obviously some mezcal, and that's like that cheesy funk, I'm like, mm-hmm. I know exactly yep. where that comes from. And it, it's amazing, because in, just in that sense, it just connects everything together. You understand the DNA of it all. Mm-hmm. you know and it, you get out of the fucking lab in other words no completely it's, it's, and like you'd start you start to see the actual you know the experiential side of it yeah, and the human exactly. side of it and you know uh when we were down there uh there's a gentleman who also works pretty deeply with tip um his name is pedro jimenez curia uh-huh. uh you know which obviously a bunch of us bartenders are like oh his name's pedro jimenez that's <laughs> hilarious <laughs> yeah. uh but he you know in my opinion he was one of the most genteel human beings in the world um and knows more about traditional mezcal and like traditional mezcaleros he yeah. runs a, a small uh mezcal educational tasting room called mezonte oh, cool. in uh guadalajara and then he has a mezcal like uh bar and like kind of like a discotheque called para de sufrir um, okay which is also awesome but he you know he he describes like the ways to identify a good traditional mezcal mm. you know and one of them is you know you shake the bottle you see the pearls right right uh, but then also like rubbing the little bit on your wrist and uh-huh. smelling it and what's amazing is now like having been down there and having visited that and having smelled like the rotting bagasso yes um yes. the second you rub it and you leave it you can immediately tell like oh yeah like that's it that's yep. that smell like totally. that's exactly what's left there or the absence of it, which comes from the cooking process and leaving exactly. it out, allowing oxygen. But anyway, but yeah, it's so mm-hmm. cool. And the, the interesting thing too is even with spirits, any other spirit, uh-huh. like cognac, armagnac, gins too. Perfuming, yeah. Exactly. It's really helpful because you can like really get in there like, oh, good. Well, they didn't cut the heads out. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's, you can smell yeah. that stuff. It's yeah. really, really cool. <laughs> they left some of the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, or the bad stuff. Yeah, exactly. depending which, very, <laughs> which craft whiskey you're smelling, I guess. But... <laughs> No well, so what is that? Did at this point when you know when you went down to Jalisco, has you already been quote unquote repping Ocho or not it at was all. still a thought? Not at all. It was still a thought. Um, and so I have to. There's there's one other story that's directly linked to this trip down yeah. to Jalisco. Um, that I actually so it's, it's important because it was just like three days ago is like the three year anniversary of it. And oh, I don't really? know if you saw. I posted a photo on Facebook a couple of days ago of me like sipping from a hikara. Ah. Um, but so we I haven't been stocking you much. Yeah, okay, whatever, Mike. <laughs> Where's my dossier, bro? Um, <laughs> I'll get, I've got your social. I'll just watch out. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, so the the, the story kind of goes is, you know, we all flew down 
uh, into Puerto Vallarta and, you know, again, like the 17 bartenders for this tip trip. And yeah. we all went out. We, you know, had beers on the beach that night. And, you know, I ate some amazing, like, uh, octopus with like a, in a garlic sauce. It yeah. was delicious. Like, you know, again, very vivid, like olfactory memories here. Um, the next morning we get up, have chilequiles, and we're getting in the van to drive up to Malpaso. Okay. And this is like, this was the day that we were going to try and hit like three or four. I think it was like three, three of the Raicieros uh-huh. in one day. And so it was going to be, it was a pretty substantial day. Um, you know, we had this like hour and a half drive out. Um, and so we all get in the van and we're, driving along about 45 minutes into the trip we all get out for a quick restroom break and i get out with everybody as well and i notice that my left hand is kind of going numb a little bit oh, and like shit. i'm like oh man that's weird like maybe i'm i'm Were probably leaning on the, i'm yeah, leaning on the yeah. windowsill too hard like i totally like dead armed myself yeah, or something right. right so we get back in um and sit there a little bit longer another like 15 minutes goes by and i notice my right hand starts going numb is the like, left one still numb? At yeah, that left one's still numb. Oh, like shit. numb and tingling, but it's yeah. really just like my pinky and my ring finger. Still. Like just tingling and it's weird. And like, so then right hand starts to go numb and I'm like, okay, this is kind of weird. And, uh, you know, like, so I'm just kind of in my own head, like, okay, is everything cool? Yeah. Like, what do I need to do? Like, I think I'm okay. Like, I'll just chill out. Like, I'm going to sip some more water from my water bottle. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, uh, I'll pop an allergy pill. Like, just like, just in case right. like, I'm having reactions to things. Um, so we keep going. Uh, the numbness spreads, the tingling spreads, my mouth starts to tingle and it actually starts to tighten up. So my hands at this oh point are God. now starting to like claw up, like yeah, basically where the muscles are kind of ner- tensing. Something nerve, nervous system. Right, muscle, nerve right? something. Um, and then I feel my stomach starting to tighten. And that that was the point that I finally freaked out. I mean, like the hands thing was one thing and the yeah. mouth thing was yeah, one yeah, thing. Yeah, but yeah. like when you feel it like internally, like your guts start to like tighten, you're like, okay, something's wrong. Um, uh, and I'm so, just, yeah, I'm, just, I'm wait. So I, I tap crazy my look on my head, my face. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> so I tap my friend Cece on the shoulder and I'm just like, Cece, I think there's something wrong with me because I'm saying this through like pursed lips. Yeah. Um, and Phil Ward is sitting next to her and I remember Phil turns around and he looks at me and he goes, dude, what the fuck is wrong with your face? Um, and it's basically just because I can't, you know, my lips are just kind of stuck. It's just tightened, right? Yeah, yeah, just tightened up. And so they stop the van, we all get out and, um, you know, everybody gets out and I remember Nick Crutchfield, who is a bartender out in DC. Yeah, yeah. Um, is he's, he's also uh, on the trip. Diageo now, isn't he? Yep, yeah. with Diageo. So it was Nick Crutchfield, Kate Gerwin was with us, uh, Matt Tanner uh-huh. uh, from Papa's, and like so, uh, Chris Mack. Like there was, it was a, it was a great group Good of group, us, like yeah. big group in general. Uh, Misty was there, um, but yeah, we got out, and I remember Nick started asking me, he's like, "Well, what did you eat this morning? What did you drink?" Um, oh, Houston Eves. Houston, Houston was there. Houston oh. was my roommate for the whole trip. I love. Houston. Um, in any case, so he's like, "What did you eat? What did you drink? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. did you notice any like itches or bites or anything?" I was like, "I don't know. I had an itch on my wrist this morning." I didn't think anything about it. And he looks, and I remember him saying something along those like, dude, I'm pretty sure there's two insertion points. Oh, shit. I think that's a spider bite. God damn it. Um, and so at this point, you know, we're now about an hour up the mountain. Yeah. And uh, there's a little gentleman with us who's from Malpaso, and his name's Roberto. Uh-huh. And Roberto comes out of the van, and, you know, I'm not trying to disparage his, no, no. His, his voice at all but like this is legitimately from my memory what he sounds like and he comes up to me and he says oh don't worry I've seen this before we go to the village and I have a cure so David David Suro from Sura, Tip yeah. turns to me and he says okay Brandon you, you have to decide we are either going to go back down the mountain an hour to Which Puerto Vallarta could kill you or we're going to go 15 minutes to the village and try Roberto's cure <laughs> so this is where like it's that moment of oh fuck i'm gonna die in mexico like i'm gonna fucking die in mexico uh but you know i've done enough drugs in my life that fuck it if we're gonna do anything let's go try Roberto's cure sure like, we're just gonna give it a shot he's seen it before he knows exactly like i am now putting absolute faith in this one human yeah um and so we get back into the van i am praying to every deity possible yeah, yeah, i'm yeah, like yeah. all right you know like my ol goddess of the agave like yeah. please like if you if if you help me get through this, I will dedicate a significant portion of my life to like better educating people about the issues that face this culture, right? Wow. And like I'm praying to you know literally every other god I can yeah, think yeah. of. Um, and so we get up to the village. Everybody rushes out of the van. Um, I remember Sophie from Calle Bentaritres was also with us, and she runs in. and She's just like emboca emboca, you know, like his mouth, yeah, so yeah, yeah. his mouth. Um, and 
when we get there, it's a village of no more than like probably like 40 to 45 people. Mm -hmm. And there are several little women of the village that are all preparing this massive meal for these bartenders that are coming. So they're all crammed into one kitchen, one very small kitchen that's probably no bigger than this room. Wow. Okay. Um, And they rush me in there and... You know, like they sit me down and they're, they're in Boca and Boca's mouth. And yeah. Roberto just slowly comes in and pass, like pushes past us. Um, and he comes up to me, takes a slice of a clove of garlic okay. and puts it onto the bug bite. And it immediately starts burning like hell. Uh, he wraps it with gauze. Okay. And then he tells me, you leave this here until it does not burn anymore. And then he hands me a tablespoon with chopped garlic and salt. Uh-huh. And he says, swallow this. And then a mug with lime juice and water, and he says, "And drink these." And so I take, <laughs> I take. The Are you table- even able to swallow I know. it? I take the tablespoon. Yeah, I take the tablespoon of garlic and salt. Uh, by the way, like we had the air conditioner blasting, and that actually like helped a little oh, bit. Okay. okay. Um, I sip down the lime juice and water, um, and then he sits me down and he squares me up in the shoulders and he looks me dead in the eye and he says, "You have to believe that this will work, because your mind is stronger than your body." What the fuck? Amazing. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then he pats me on the back and he says, and when you feel better, you come see me and I'll give you Ricea. <laughs> and then he leaves. <laughs> Are you just in a room alone or something? I am now thoughts? left in this kitchen with these little women all preparing this meal. Oh my I don't, God. I speak maybe like, you know, a few words of right, Spanish. Right, right. Uh, really terribly at that. But you know, I'm just like, oh my God, I'm, gonna, I'm seriously going to die in Mexico. And so I start, like, I pull out my phone and I'm like, you know, I have no service because I didn't play f- pay for like a, right, a roaming right, plan, right. whatever. And I'm like, but I have to like at least write these thoughts down because if I die, somebody has to know what the hell happened. Yeah. Uh, mind you, my wife is also a doctor. So it's also going to be like, she's going to want to know what the happened to, you know, right. to my husband. And so I'm like writing notes in Evernote feverishly like, oh, I'm going to do, okay, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and, you know, just basically documenting the whole thing. And in about 15 minutes, all of the symptoms except for tingling in my ring and pinky yeah. fingers subsided. Wow. Um, my f- ring and pinky fingers, in particular, my left hand. Is that because uh, that were where the bite that was, was right? Yeah, yeah, that was the side. Um, it was about four and a half, five hours later that those symptoms finally subsided, and I was actually at dinner with CC, like, and I took a photo, and it was just like a g- giant wheel oh left from God. where the garlic was, yeah. and like just because I had basically a garlic burn at that point too, yeah. um, you know, but. It was one of those like, okay, so that's my I almost died in Mexico story. And, you know, God. so basically I came back from this whole trip, this whole tip trip, like seeing all these things, like nearly dying, being saved by like what is arguably like an indigenous cure. Yeah. Um, You know, my wife makes the argument that the allergy pill that I popped in the in the van may have also had some some restorative effects but yeah i mean like but the tightening that's an yeah so i mean yeah the discussion that we were talking about she's like yeah but i mean it was showing symptoms on both sides that's you know it's really unusual um in any case you know i i don't i don't want to try and understand too much of what happened because it doesn't matter exactly it just happened yeah and to me that was so deeply like in it it was a great representation of their culture and everything that they're about too right because here they are, people that, you know, whether it, it, it was a cure or not, they're the ones who see it and say, like, oh, no, that's what you've got? Oh, I totally have natural things that will cure that. Like, right. that's just their their method of operation. Which is great because it's just, it's a, in the West, it's so different, you know, because we're just like, yeah. well, no, I just put a bunch of pills on her. And we'll Completely. In the hospital. Like, no, garlic's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's very therapeutic. Garlic and honey yeah. and lime and, like, you know. Mezcal. The, you know, Mezcal, exactly. You know, uh, have you heard of Tio Ray? The, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So apparently when I was up there with Houston as well, actually, we were visiting Acalino and there's this story about Tio Ray where he was chopping down some agave and he chopped his foot, he chopped his toe and he poured some, and it was bleeding and all this, <laughs> and he poured some mezcal and he's like, it's fine now. And then he just like kept going. <laughs> I'm like, you son of a bitch. The yeah. first the first thing they did when they unwrapped the gauze was they poured ricea over it. Yeah. And when I got down there, he greeted me with, you know, like a decent size hikara yeah. with, it was a 64% chereka, which is like the heads of the second run. Okay, wow. All right, so it's Brilliant. like heads of the second run at like 64%. Yep, it's just yep. like, here you go, have Ricea. And I was like, all right, I'm officially in Mexico now. It's amazing, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, a life-changing trip in, in a lot of, in a lot of ways um so what did you vow to do when you came back i when bet I, you had a couple things when, when i came back uh i basically said all right i i i really wanted this tequila in the market initially yeah. um i know that ocho was one of the brands that worked deeply with the, the yeah. tequila oh, and change yeah. project and i was like so like i 
I'm going to make this a thing. I'm actually going to make this happen. I'm going to get Tequila Ocho to Kansas City. I don't know how. I still don't understand how, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. And so it was like that month they had started doing the uh, the submissions for Viva Sangrita again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there was a uh, semifinals in, in Colorado. And I was like, well, so I reached out to Josh and Scott. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, guys, like, would you mind like just send me some sample bottles I would love to like taste the USBG on it. The bartenders like I have a bunch of bar buddies who I, I bet would be geeked out on this and would yeah, love yeah. to enter Sangrita. Um, and so they shipped me out, you know, a Plata, a Repo, and an Añejo. And like I sat down and I did a whole like basically showed photos from my tip trip and talked about my almost dying experience. And then like I was like I was like, but aside from that, like here's a cool brand. Like they're doing some cool stuff. I kind of understand some things about it. Yeah, um, I'm learning more about it. But you know, I know they support tip. Um, and they have this contest coming up. And so they ended up getting, I'm trying to remember, but I think Josh and Scott said they got almost an equivalent amount of entries from Kansas City as they did from Colorado. Oh, amazing. Um, you know, and if nothing else, I know for sure that we had a finalist that went out to Colorado to compete from yeah. Kansas City. Um, and so because of that, they were like, well, maybe this is a market we should look at. And so I then yeah. started reaching, you know, that's when I met Lyons, mm-hmm. who is the owner of Altamar Brands. Um, and I connected Lions with uh, J.P. Gilmore, who owns Vintegrity Wine and Spirits, okay. which is like my favorite distributor in, in Kansas City, Kansas as City. well as like, you know, pulling a bunch of my bar buddies. They were all in agreement as well. Right. Like that's the way to go. Yeah. They yeah. are like the dudes that, you know, and I was like, look, it's not it's not like a high volume product. It's right. not like we're not going to put this in every margarita in the world. Like you don't want to. It's no, it's a really high quality product that, it, you know, it's culty. People yeah. are people like. You want the, the nerdy best or people, you want the most? Exactly. Right. The nerdy people are the people that we are looking for. Absolutely. Like, it just makes, the, you know, it makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so got them in touch and got it registered. And then by the time, like, it was registered and set up, uh, like, I actually went out to California to go do a shoot with Lush Life. Uh-huh. Um, and while I was there, I was like, well, we're in San Francisco. I've got to go to Trick Dog. Sure. So, like, I went in and I saw Josh. Because you talked to Josh already, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, I would known those guys. And so I went in and I was bullshitting with him. And he was like, hey, by the way, he's like, I actually just had a conversation with Lions yesterday um, about you. And I was like, about me? Like, why the hell were you talking about me? Like, bastard, what are you doing? I know. And he was like, well, he's like, look, man. He's like, we actually think you'd be a really good candidate to be an ambassador. Yeah. For Ocho in Missouri, and I was like, "Excuse me, like that would be amazing." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to do that. I, you know, because at this point, I was like, "I'm just pursuing my photo video career. Like, I'm still involved with the spirits industry. Yeah. You know, I'm running a cocktail festival in Kansas City at this point. Uh, we'd started up the Paris of the Plains cocktail festival. That's a thing. Mm-hmm. I haven't even mentioned that yet. <laughs> um, and you know, and so it was just like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And um, Next thing I know, in August, when the brand actually officially like went, got up and running, yeah. there I was now working market. Um, Amazing. So really, really quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, and yeah. Were you still it all doing all together. the other stuff, too? Or did you have to drop one or the other? I still, today, am doing all of the other stuff as well. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, technically right now, uh, you know, I'm one of the co-founders of the Paris of the Plains Cocktail Festival uh-huh. that happens annually at the end of August, although I have officially stepped back slightly this year in right. my role just because I'm so busy. Um I have several amazing business partners that are helping me run uh, an events and consulting business called Liquid Minded Concepts. Amazing. Um, uh, national just in Missouri or I would or say regional? primarily focused in Kansas City and okay. Missouri, but we have done some international work. Oh, wow. um, I can't okay. say who our client was, no, but right. some cool menu yeah, development sure. stuff. Um, and then doing like large batch event production. Yeah. Uh, that stuff as well. Um, I then also obviously have my uh, video production and media production side of things. Right. You're so still working I'm, with Lush Life there then too? Um, yeah, actually they had just offered me a shoot here in, in about a month, but unfortunately because of my travel schedule, I couldn't take it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I love working with those guys and you know would still take every opportunity, especially uh, they have a producer on uh, on staff now. His name is Ryan French. Oh yeah. French. yeah, yeah, yeah. Used to live here in Austin. Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. I, I know some of those guys for He's sure. He's a sweet dude. He's a really sweet dude. And I would take, I take, I will take every opportunity I have to to work with that dude. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then all of my work with Altamar, which has now expanded significantly. Right. So it was you guys about, have, because you started with, the, so Altamar is what, like a house, you guys are the ones that bring it into Missouri? Basically? Altamar Brands is an importer. Okay. So we are, we are the U.S., we are the exclusive U.S. importer for Tequila Ocho, wow. uh, okay. for Right Gin, for Kubler Absinthe, um, for you know, Square Rum, for Square Rum Distillery. And then we're about to start importing uh, Chateau Arton Armagnac, which is oh. an oat Armagnac. Very cool. um, so you know, it's 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 a pretty what? amazing experience. Is to it be in the are you importing through New York or 
uh, uh, coast. Our port is in New Jersey. New Jersey, cool. Yep. Yeah, cool. At least for that, we have a port in Oakland, California. Yeah, and then we have a port in New Jersey. Very cool. So, but I mean, like, what's crazy is you know. So about eight months ago, Lyons approached me mm-hmm. again, and he said, "Look, he's like, you know, we're now at a point in the company like Ocho has, you know, grown significantly and yeah. it's supporting us very well." He's like, you know, but. He's like, you know, I w- I believe very strongly that everything else in our portfolio is also very right, strong like with, that, you know, yeah. and he's like, you know, for, from his perspective and, you know, what I now fully agree with as well is that every brand in the portfolio has to stand on three legs, right? Mm-hmm. It has to have a producer who is, you know, su- like for one, deeply ingrained in their tradition, right? Um, understands the tradition of the spirit they're producing, um, and is deeply passionate about you know what they are yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number two, it has to come from a unique home place. Okay, you know, so like when we're talking like you know Ocho, you know, obviously from Mexico, we're talking uh, Four Square Rum Distillery from Barbados, we're mm-hmm. talking Armagnac from you know yeah. the oh, yeah. Armagnac exactly. Like it's a <laughs> it's an AOC, so yeah. like it's clearly from a you know specific Absolutely. place. And then you know like Kubler from Switzerland and the Val de Travers, like also yeah like deeply ingrained and then three it has to be unique in its category in some way shape or form i see you know it has to be unique and different and challenging but all you know it has to be at at first and foremost it has to be of the the highest quality yeah you know and so like quality should never be an argument um with any of the stuff that we're dealing with no of course i mean um stuff's ocho is i mean it is a uh a mile marker it is the the benchmark for for tequila the standards you know it's really incredible. And so with the right gin, what what do you say is that unique piece in the market for that particular gin? So you have to look at, and I actually, so I had a great conversation with Enrique Fasil, who is our master blender for that uh-huh. and lives here in Austin. Yeah, and you and I were kind of BSing about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, talking with him about it. And the, the thing is, is that Wright was, Wright was actually the first brand created by Altamar. Oh, really? And it was okay. created in 2007. So it's almost 10 years old. Wow. Um, and so what's, what's somewhat challenging is you have to kind of think back to where the gin world was in 2007. Right. Totally. Um, and yeah, I mean, the goal was to be not juniper forward Yeah. because it was like at that point, new Western, new American style gins were not nearly as prevalent as they are today. Yeah. And, you know, so they, they, they kept having this discussion between Lyons and Enrique of like, you know, well, I really don't like gin. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I like things about gin, but there aren't many gins that I like. You know, and so what is it that I don't like and how can we actually like evolve beyond that? And yeah. what it was is that they felt that the, you know, there was too much juniper presence. It okay. was too oily. It was yeah. too heavy. Yeah, yeah. They wanted something that was going to be cleaner, more refreshing, a Chris. little bit more kind of citrus forward. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, Enrique also takes a blender's approach, you know, where everything is distilled separately and then blended together. Yeah, that's a very different, um, definitely different. Yeah. So... You know, it was that that those were the major kind of defining characteristics of it. Um, you know, what's interesting though is, you know, we're now at a point in the evolution of the brand um, that we're discussing. You know, like what what is what what is the future of right? Because yeah. now that the gin community has evolved to where it is, like, is it as relevant? You know, yeah. are there things that we can do that are, that kind of challenge it a little bit more? Right. Um, and so we're kind of we're toying with those thoughts. You know, and kind of seeing what happens there. And I don't know how much I can say on the record. Oh, no, no, that's but, fine. But, I mean, bottom line is that the market's changing. It's yeah, ever completely. Expanding. It's what I would even consider a saturated at this point with yeah. so many different gins. And so you have to think about as a, as a gin distiller and donor, like, mm-hmm. I understand that. And there's, like, how do you still carve your path? or carve Right. Your and, stay, and I mean, you know, and again, kind of still sticking to those three principles, mm-hmm. like what was once, you know, different and unique yeah now is not really so different and unique anymore like yeah. i like i love i i actually really appreciate the botanical blend mm-hmm. it's so it's very citrus forward um you know because it's like if we look at the botanicals it's like 30 percent, 35 percent juniper gotcha uh 16 percent sarawak black pepper from malaysia uh-huh. um 15 percent russian coriander leaf and then we get into like sicilian lemon sicilian bergamot west yeah, indies yeah. bitter orange west indies lime oh, and then heavy heavy peels and citrus. exactly yeah. and then finished out with indian cardamom and so okay. you've got like these five botanicals that are effectively citrus forward or have like the identity of citrus right yeah you know and then to couple that back with you know the essentially the, the pepper and the yeah. juniper and then that little bit of you know cilantro sure, russian, sure. russian coriander right leaf. right <laughs> um you know like i think it's a really interesting botanical blend and you know that there aren't a ton of citrus forward gins that are that clean on the palate right 
Um, just, yeah, I need to try. I need to talk to John and Matt to get, get a sample because we're, we're same same distributor. So yeah, we're, exactly. we're label mates in that respect. <laughs> we're yeah. label mates. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. So that's so you've been. What is the exact position then with Altamar? So my title, yeah, uh, title. you know the big, the What's big, the, card the big say? fancy title yeah. is Senior Brand Development Director. Ooh, um, development director. But what, the title that I actually like is the colloquialism that Lyons likes to share um, amongst all of us, and he's like, "No, Brandon is the Minister of Truth." Hey, there we go. <laughs> so, I mean, the the whole point is that my role is to really tease out all of the little details of the production process, yeah. talking with the producers. Uh, talking, you know, about the farming methods, uh, right, talking right. about the overall production methods, and what is it that makes every product unique and different. So yeah. I don't want to necessarily like approach it from a heavy sales marketing background and saying like, oh, you know, it's just like it's the best, most flavorful, smoothest thing. No, you know, you need something more. I want to know. Than that. I want to know yeah. the factual information. I want to know like, all right, so what is the water source you're using for cutting the spirit? Right. You know. How are you treating that water? What you know? Are you doing open fermentation or closed fermentation? If right. you're using closed fermentation, how are you capturing your CO two? Right. Are you capturing your CO two? Open air you yeast, know. pitching exactly. Yeast, all, yeah, yeah. Lots what of details you, like that, which I think are very important to the people in the industry because we're such nerds. We're right. Rats. Well, and I mean, to me, harkens back completely to the wine background yeah. because you know what Chef always used to say was that you know no wine is better than another. Some wines are better for one person yeah. than another. And it's your job to understand all the nuanced differences so you can give them the best wine for what they're looking right. for. There is no panacea. Like You're right. It's totally what works for you, this is for you. Right. If this doesn't work for you, fine. And mm-hmm. that's the good thing to know about sales. And the thing that I think larger distributors don't understand. Yeah. It's like, no, this is for everybody. Just put it in the back bar. Like, no, no, dude. no. It's, yeah. No. And I mean, and especially when you're dealing with, you know, what I would consider small, special, culty brands, yeah. like you've got to, you got to kind of, you know, you got to give your due diligence and like figuring all this shit out. Yeah, do, you do. And so, people are going to ask you questions that you don't know. Yeah. And that's good. Exactly. You can and, go and you can try to understand. You know, it. and so from my perspective, whenever I'm, whenever I encounter anything like that, my response is like, you know, what, I don't know, but I totally am going to find out. Yeah. Let me get your information. And honestly, a lot of those things are then what go into the materials that I'm developing. So yeah. I'm also then in charge of, you know. Building PowerPoint presentations, building the you know sell sheets, yeah. all those things. Uh, we're rebuilding the website right now. Uh, I'm basically loading it up with content. A killer. Um, you know the right guy to do that. Yeah. And so <laughs> I mean, fortunately, like uh, we just got done producing four. We're producing five total videos from the Armagnac. Um, so Amazing. I got to go out there in October and film with them, and then uh, took a trip down to Barbados, filmed with Richard at Foursquare. Wow. And so, and then a uh, film down at Ocho again with both with Carlos and those guys. And I'm going to try and grab Tomas yeah. here in the next bit too. What, uh, when is that Armagnac kit in Texas? You know, um, it should be, it's arriving in New Jersey here in the next week. Oh, cool. Um, so for Texas, it'll probably be another month, month probably and a half. Enough. Yeah. Cause we'll have to go through separate cola and all that. Yeah. Um, but it's coming. So I'm really excited. So, I mean like, I don't know how familiar you are with Armagnac. Yeah, like ish. Right. So like Baz Armagnac is like ninety huh? percent of the production. Yeah. But it's like one of the smaller regions. You have Tenerez, which is a little bit larger, which is about eight percent of the production. Mm-hmm. And then you have Oat Armagnac, which is the largest region, but the small but only two percentage of the production. Why is and, well, I guess that's another question, but like why is it so small? So there's a there's a lot of theories behind it. Um one so for one the soil content is significantly different. So when you're in Baz Armagnac, it's a very like sand, sand yeah. rich soil. Uh, when you get to Oat Armagnac, it's chalk. Oh, so it's a, de- it's a much different type of soil. Uh, and you know, when phylloxera, uh, basically hit all of the French vineyards, mm-hmm. um, what ended up happening is the way that you basically combat against phylloxera is you have to overwater your vines. Okay. Is what is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in Oat Armagnac, because they're dealing with this chalk heavy soil oh, and everything else and being further from it's non-coastal it's more inland whereas yeah. Baz Armagnac is coastal um what you end up having is a lot of the producers not able to save their vines um further at the end of phylloxera you then have the cereal grain movement as being a much more valuable subsidy or you know commodity right, for them right. to grow and so you're seeing people switch from grapes to grain um in Oat Armagnac because it was less expensive you know it's and not susceptible of the same right right yeah um and so you know in general what you what you end up seeing is that an area that was rich in producers went down to very few producers and so for the longest time Oat Armagnac has actually been regarded as you know somewhat insipid not full flavored Armagnac yeah yeah um and so what was really challenging for us at least was you know when we encountered this producer in particular like 
I really wanted to vet that this was going to be a really high quality Armagnac, yeah. you know, especially considering it was coming from the Oat region. Right. Um, so it's won gold and silver medals against other Armagnacs in blind tastings in France, wow. um, you know, which to me, you know, obviously you can win a gold just about anywhere sure. in the U S yeah. you know, if you pay for the competitions, you can probably get in, probably get a medal. Yep. Um, Agreed. but you know, for it to be a blind tasting and, you know, by a panel of judges against in the category of Armagnac right. in France, uh, to that's me, a bigger yeah. deal for sure. And you know, so it was, I don't know. And meeting, meeting the people, seeing the place. So they found the, uh, the vineyards in the seventies and at that point, it was basically just totally left. No one had done anything with it. And so they replanted all the vines themselves, initially with the goal of just making wine. Mm. Um, you know, but they said, well, this area is so steeped in tradition of Armagnac. Maybe we should make Armagnac as well. Um, and so they started producing. Uh, their first Armagnac was in 1991. Oh, wow. Um, you know, so the first Armagnac to come off the still was in 91. So and which then, one of you guys, what year was the Armagnac, or unless there's multiple SKUs, but when we, was that distilled, the one you guys are bringing in? So we are bringing in three expressions from them. Okay. Uh, we are bringing in a Blanche Armagnac. Okay. So a totally white, sure. you know, uh, at 45% too. So it's awesome. Like, oh, good. big full flavor. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I geeked out about it when we were out there. I was like, yeah. oh man, I've never had anything like this before. Um, then we have, we're bringing in their La Reserve, which is their blend. Mm -hmm. Um, and their blended Armagnac is no less than six years, about yeah. five or six years of age. Um, and then we are bringing in the 2005 for their vintage. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, because basically for them, if they're going to release their Millicime, which is their vintage, it's 10 years. 10 years. Okay. And so, you know, 2015 just wrapped. Yeah. So that's that one. Um, but they will only release the vintage and it will only be one or two barrels and only the very best barrels. Oh, now amazing. what's amazing is they're like their Shea, you know, where they're doing all of their aging has no more than like 35 or 40 barrels in it. I mean, so like production volume wise, they are itty bitty. Yeah. It's really, really you know I mean? So again, we're talking like, these are not, these are not going to be everywhere in the U S these are going to be in very select places. And, yeah. I mean, it sounds know. delicious even on a Monday morning. Yeah. And I'm just going to keep thinking I'm going to have to keep if if it ever makes its way to Texas, which I hope it it will. Special ones. It will. Yeah. So I basically I put in a special request. I was like, look, if I'm going to be going down to Texas regularly working you need in the market, to send it down to Texas. I, I really would love to have this with yeah, me. It's got to so, be down there. Well, it's yeah. brilliant, man. And what so where are you headed next? Are you getting back to Kansas City? I go back to Kansas City for one day. Okay. And then go back you to Kansas City on. one day and then I'm headed to Nashville for the Music City Spirits and Cocktail Festival. Wow. Okay. Um and so a good buddy of mine, John Yeager, uh it's the that's founder of Jaeger Meister, right? Of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh but no, he uh he he runs that as well as runs a little like consulting group out there. Yeah. And he's from Kansas City originally. Amazing. Uh he supported me at my festival several years, so I figured it's about damn time I go out and support him. So we're gonna do uh like a big trade seminar. I'm gonna do a deep dive into agave. Cool. Um and then probably, you know, showcase some rum and absinthe and gin cocktails. That's and amazing. then uh and then from there, so I'm there Thursday and Friday. Friday night I fly to Chicago. Uh, for the Midwest Rum Fest. Wow. Uh, where I'll be hanging out with Richard Seal and the Four Square Rum Distillery folks and cool. spreading the love up there. And then I go back to Nashville uh, to go hang out with John a little bit more and then actually go like get to meet the distributor. So because yeah. now that I'm actually on board with the company, part yeah, of yeah. this is also now like making sure that the distributors are, you know, fully aware and that, you know, secondarily I'm now meeting a lot of my friends again. Right. It's just like, hey man, like I know you probably met me and I had a camera in front of my face, but like this is the other thing that I do. Yeah, you can you make know? it a little bit more of a quality yeah. interaction now. It's pretty brilliant. So it's been amazing chatting with you. I have one last question for you because yeah, I want please. to tie it back to music. What are you listening to? What am I listening to? Yeah. Oh yeah. man, we were talking about this actually at the beginning. So I just uh recently went to uh, Life and Times show. Yeah. And so they have been burning my ear holes pretty hard. Alan, man. Um, yeah, I know. Alan Epley's amazing. Um, but yeah, I know their new album, Live Bees, uh, just picked up on vinyl. I'm oh, now cool. one of those guys. It's like, yeah, I picked it up on vinyl. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I did. I brought, I just picked that up recently. So that's been, that's been a big one. And then, yeah, that's really been the main thing that's been spinning that in a, uh, some Buena Vista social club. Ah, uh, okay. Just cause like, I like yeah. to put that on when I'm working around the house and you know, have you checked out the new PJ Harvey record? I have not. It's insane. Is it? Yeah, it's like ch chanty Irish okay. songs. <laughs> yeah, which doesn't surprise anybody, but I've yeah. tried it. But they're still pop songs. It's really strange the way that it's produced. Like I think you'd really appreciate it because it's okay. not PJ Harvey in a band. Yeah. It's PJ Harvey and other dudes in the Barry Sax, all like a wall of vocals. Yeah. It is really strange. Okay. But worth checking out. Okay. That sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's not bad. It'll, uh, you'll want to go to a pub after, I think, and just okay. kind of rally and <laughs> shake a, shake maybe, a pint. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll force my uh, family to listen to that tonight and, you know, convince them, like, <laughs> hey, we should go out drinking. It's good. It gets you riled up. It yeah. Really does. Man, it's, 
amazing chatting, good chatting music, good chatting agave, good chatting spider bites, even if it is a bad memory for you. But Brandon, you know, I'm glad we made it work, man, because it took about a week and a half. But you were in town for a long time, and it was brilliant getting to know you. I hope next time you're in town, you bring me up. Yeah, for sure, man. Cool. Thanks Pleasure. for chatting. Thanks. Well, there we have it. What do you guys think? All Tamar Brands, Brandon Cummins, an interesting guy, quite creative, good with technology, good with music, good with people. And like so many other guests he was born into, that he was destined to be part of this hospitality industry. And I can't wait to try the Foursquare Rum from 2004. I think there are a few bottles still in Texas remaining. I know it's sold out in California. I hear it is just fucking incredible. So thanks everybody for listening to Show to V. No matter what kinds of personal battles you have at work or with your bank account or what kinds of things you'd like to learn how to do next, like speak Spanish in a very, very competent way, please keep dancing.